Okay, so we're going to take a look in this video at binding energy and its influence on the different types of decay that occur and also fission and fusion and stuff like that. Okay, so first of all, what is binding energy? So binding energy is the energy you release when you form a nucleus. Or alternatively, you can think about it as the energy you have to put into a nucleus in order to split it into its constituent parts. Either of those two will give you the same energy and so it's the same thing. Okay, so the reason this is important is because if you actually were able to somehow weigh a nucleus, what you'd find is the mass of the nucleus is less than the sum of its constituent parts. So some mass has gone somewhere and this binding energy is a mechanism to explain what's going on there. So this difference in mass is often known as the mass defect. And it's actually the m in e equals mc squared, for instance, in the equation that most people know. Okay, uh, so that's what's going on. So let's have a look at why this kind of energy exists in the first place. Okay, so those of you who do chemistry and know it beforehand um, will have met things like exothermic reactions. So an example of this would be hydrogen and oxygen. And the reason it releases energy to the surroundings is because essentially it takes less energy to break the bonds between hydrogen and hydrogen and oxygen and oxygen and then is gained by releasing, that is released in the hydrogen oxygen bonds that form water. So essentially you get a net gain in energy from that, which is where the energy, like, so energy comes out of that. So it's the same here with your nucleus. So when the constituent parts come together, when they form bonds between them through the strong force, what actually happens is energy gets released to the surroundings. So why, where is this energy coming from? Like, what is it to do with? Well, it's to do with potential energy, and we can see it by looking at the strong force graph here. So we've got a nucleus that's formed. Uh, the, the nucleons will be separated somewhere around here, somewhere between 1.75 and 2 femtometers, so they'll be about here. So if we want to be able to separate them, what we have to do is put in some work so we can move them up to zero potential energy there. Then they'll be completely separated. So to separate them, we have to put work in to go that way. Therefore, if you go the opposite way and bring nucleons together, you can essentially transfer some of their like, potential energy, that you're because you're going very negative in potential energy, into another form. So typically uh, kinetic energy or something along those lines. So that's where this energy is coming from. So this isn't electromagnetic like you'd have seen before. This is in terms of strong potential energy there. Okay, so that's kind of where, where this idea of energy is coming from. So let's actually do some calculations to see how this works. So if we do it for iron, and you'll see later on why I picked iron, um, you can get a total mass of an iron nucleus of this value here. We can also calculate the mass of its constituent parts by multiplying the mass of a nucleon by 56, because that's how many nucleons there are. And if we find the difference between these values, we come up with something called a mass defect. So we've got a difference between those two numbers of this number, which is a very small number, but obviously we're dealing in very, very small masses here, so that's not surprising. So then in terms of working out how much energy that represents, we finally get to use this most famous equation, E equals mc squared. Is this what this equation does is it allows you to calculate binding energy from mass defect. So I've seen loads of people in the past misuse this. They just think mass and energy like equate to each other somehow. That's not really on it. This equation is designed to relate mass defect and binding energy. So if we know the mass defect, we know the speed of light, we can work out how much binding energy is associated with this nucleus. So how much would be released when the nucleus forms, or how much we have to put in when we split the nucleus apart, should we want to do that. Okay, so we're dealing with very small numbers here. So you might be thinking, oh my god, there's so much standard form, I'm writing times 10 to the minus 27 all the time. Isn't there some way of making this much simpler? Of course there is. Physicists are genius at basically being lazy and writing less. Um, so they came up with this idea of an atomic mass unit. An atomic mass unit is one twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom, and it has a value of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So you might be sitting there wondering to yourself, uh, what, why carbon-12? Um, there's lots of stories, if you like, look on the internet, that like somehow it's easier to measure, it's more stable. Uh, but the answer is more simple than that. 
Um, originally, they used oxygen, and physicists used oxygen 16, and chemists used a combination of oxygen 16, 17, and 18. And they could not agree which of those two was right, uh, but they wanted to agree a standard method, so they were like, okay, let's make none of us right, we'll pick something else, so they picked carbon 12. That's essentially the origin of your carbon 12 thing going on here. Okay, so when you're dealing with all this binding energy and later on we look at fission and fusion, you're going to see things as multiples of the atomic mass unit. So for a proton, you'll see it is 1.00728U. Typically, you'll see that written mostly in this bucket here. Okay, so we've got mass defect. We've got it in terms of U now. Hopefully, you're going to simplify things. Can we take a shortcut to get binding energy from that? Yes, we can. Um, obviously, it's very sad that having just learned how to use E equals MT squared, we're already keen to go jump straight out and stop using it. Uh, but absolutely, you can. So if you, you can work out essentially the binding energy associated with one atomic mass unit of mass defect. So you put the numbers in here. You do your calculation. Um, I realized I forgot to write in the times 10 to the minus 27 here. And you end up with this value in joules, or typically you see it in mega electron volts. That's the unit of nuclear physics. We typically deal in mega electron volts there. So 931 mega electron volts. So if you know the mass defect in U, if one U is equal to this, you can work out essentially what you, the mass defect you have is in terms of that. So that's a slight shortcut you can take to involve lots of squaring of standard form and stuff like that. Okay, so you know, like what, why is this relevant? What, we now know how to calculate binding energy. We're like familiar with the fact that like, nuclei release binding energy when they're formed. But you know, how does this actually affect anything? So, Binding energy affects where, essentially what process will happen to a nucleus. So like what kind of decay it will undergo, whether it will undergo fission, fusion, all of those kind of things. So all of these processes occur to try and increase the binding energy per nucleon. So what that means is if you get the total binding energy for a nucleus, divide it by the nucleon number, that gives you the binding energy per nucleon. And a higher binding energy per nucleon equals more stable. So it's just another way of describing stability there. Okay, so for instance, like any of these kind of things, alpha, beta, gamma, fission, fusion, all of this stuff are all dictated by binding energy per nucleon. They're all processes to try and increase it overall. So let's have a look at an example and let's have a look at uranium. So in my video, we were talking about the nuclear reactors. I talked about how uranium naturally will undergo alpha decay. So let's have a look at one of those. So we can get the total mass of your uranium nucleus and your total masses of the two daughter products of a, um, of a alpha decay. So one of them being thorium, one of them being an alpha particle itself. We can calculate the mass defect from that process there. And what we can do is get this number here, and that allows us to essentially calculate how much energy is released in each of the decays. So that's one way we can approach this, and we can see that energy is released as a part of the process. So um, that's why you often end up with the products emitting gamma radiation, because they have all of this energy here. All right, that's all very well and good, but you didn't talk about like binding energy per nucleon. Fair question. Um, so let's actually have a look at that. So before, the binding energy per nucleon of your parent, your uranium-235, was 931.18088. So it's the total binding energy divided by 238 in this case, being the number of nucleons. That will give you the binding energy per nucleon. Okay. However, with the daughter products, if we do the calculation, so we add the two binding energies divided by the total number of nucleons, we can see that on average, their binding energy per nucleon has very slightly increased. It's only a slight increase, but it has increased because that's gone from an eight to a nine. So you can see the binding energy per nucleon has increased. So we've increased the stability slightly, which is why that reaction will occur. So the uranium will undergo alpha decay specifically because it can, uh, because it wants to, because it wants to be more stable there. So that's how binding energy per nucleon works. So although we've increased the binding energy per nucleon, we've actually emitted energy. So we've gained energy from that reaction. It's sent energy to the surroundings. Okay, 
So then let's have a look at this graph, which if you flip open many books on fission and fusion, you will come across straight away. So we get two zones on this graph. We get what's called the fusion zone and we get the fission zone. And it's all to do with the fact that they want to acquire binding energy per nucleon. But anything that's over here wants to undergo fission because that would, as you can see, cause it to increase its binding energy per nucleon. Anything in this side here wants to go through fusion because it wants to increase its binding energy per nucleon. And they're both heading towards the golden zone where iron 56, uh, the greatest of all uh, elements from the nuclear physics perspective, is because it has the highest binding energy per nucleon. So that's where all of these things want to be. And fission and fusion are processes of that essentially things will undergo to try and get there. So whether it has to be induced with fission, like in a reactor, or it happens naturally, they're still trying to get to that point there. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples of that. So fission, for instance. So uranium-235 has a binding energy of 7.59. You can look it up or calculate it for yourself. It's two daughter products of fission. Uh, in one case, you've got technetium and indium, and they are binding energy, as you can see, they're all over eight. So we can see that from that reaction, we've increased the binding energy per nucleon for, in this case, both of them. So the average binding energy has definitely gone up. Okay, so um, one thing to clarify with this, obviously we have to put a neutron in to cause this to happen and we get some spare neutrons out. However, they're not bound to a nucleus, so they're not gonna be involved in your binding energy calculations because they're not bound to anything. They haven't released any energy by going closer together. And then from this, we can actually work out how much energy we get from this. So if we look at the total energy before and the total energy after, we see some energy has gone somewhere. So it's been transferred to kinetic energy, usually, of the daughter products. So that's why we do a fission reaction in a nuclear reactor, because there's a net movement of energy from, the, obviously, the nucleus of your uranium to outside in terms of the kinetic energy initially of your daughter products there. So increased stability and given out energy, good stuff for us. Now this one is the subject of a lot of research, the process of fusion. This happens inside stars at the moment, and that's the process where we get obviously the energy coming from the sun. Now, um, if we have a look at this, so typically what you get is a fusion of deuterium and tritium. And those of you who like the latest Spider-Man movies, that was the subject of what Dr. Octopus was trying to look at. He was he was robbing for uh, tritium because he wanted it for his fusion reactor. So we, we've got binding energy per nucleon about one or so, nearly three here. When you fuse them together, they make helium, and helium has a binding energy per nucleon of 7.1. So we get a massive increase in stability there, and it releases a large amount of energy per fusion. So some of you looking at me are like, wow, that sounds great. We should definitely do that on Earth. Yes, that's a great idea in practice. However, the problem with fusion is you need to get the particles into the range of the strong force to be able to bind them together. So your deuterium nucleus and your tritium nucleus have to get, obviously, into the order of magnitude of the strong force, so 10 to the minus 15 or so closeness. That takes a heck of a lot of kinetic energy to be able to get that close, because obviously you need to transfer the kinetic energy into electric potential energy as they move closer and closer together, and Electromagnetic is a very strong force, so that's a massive amount of kinetic energy they have to have. So you have to be in incredibly hot conditions. So center of a star, yay, really hot, that works really well. But it doesn't work very well on Earth because we can't really easily create those conditions without expending a large amount of energy. And so that's the biggest problem they're facing with fusion at the moment. Not being able to do it per se, but actually being able to do it in a way you get more energy out than you put in. That's the real difficulty there at the moment. Okay, so that's uh, fusion, and um, I hope you found that useful, looking at binding energy and finally getting to use E equals MC squared, yay. Um, but like always, if you've noticed any problems or there are any issues with anything I said, please do let me know. And as always, thank you very much for watching.